flies Paul from Volaticus here. Today we're going to be doing a flight into high altitude ski resorts starting from Albuquerque International and flying into Telluride Regional as Albuquerque is the short final Mr X premium scenery for Albuquerque International Sunsport. Uh, airports and we're going to be taking the Challenger 300 Captain Edition which is by D-Den and they both are available from your favourite store. Telluride is the XP stock uh, and on the way we're going to be using New Mexico and Colorado Ortho 4 XP which are both free from explain.org. For flight planning we're using Simbrief and for IFR maps, charts and approaches we're going to be using Navigraph charts. So the route is a fairly simple route, just 221 nautical miles. Uh, starting at Albuquerque. So Albuquerque, uh, runway 26, elevation 5,300 feet. It's fairly flat, some mountains in the area, but it is high altitude. And into Telluride. So Telluride is um, up at 9,000 feet, fairly high altitude airports. Uh, it has the joy of mountains in the near vicinity with a bit of a challenging mist approach procedure. So let's have a look at the departure from Albuquerque. So we're using runway 26 which is nearly 14,000 feet which is ample for most aircraft and we're going to be following the Largo 3 departure which is out the airport to Albuquerque, Vuar, Hanos and then up to Rattlesnake. And then into Telluride, we're going to be following the Arnav Zulu for runway 9, which starts at the Echo Tango Lima VOR, Setma, and then the approach. And in the event of missed approach, back to the Echo Tango Lima VOR, avoiding any mountains in the way. Telluride itself, just over 7,000 foot in length, with an elevation of just over 9,000 feet, which is going to make it interesting. We're going to be flying in the Challenger 300, the D-Den Challenger 300 Captain Edition, uh, which is my favorite aircraft, I've got to say. And I've been spending quite a bit of time flying this aircraft and really trying to get um, into the detail of it, uh, because although it's fairly simple to get into, um, to actually um, get good at, it's, it takes some time. So we're based here at Albuquerque, we're actually at the Laser Center, uh, which is at the um, eastern end of the main runway, um, at the Richard Davis Advanced Laser Facility. Um, and it's just one of the points that you can start flight off. Uh, this is the Mr. X Albuquerque scenery. It's, um, I think, one of my favorite packages. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, I love getting flights to start from here or terminating here. Um, I'm going to give a quick overview. Um, so we're currently in the sort of camera mode. I'm just going to sort of um, skew around the airport so you can actually see some of the detail. Uh, now this airport has been out for a while. Um, certainly I've been using it as long as I can remember. Uh, it has a huge amount of ground texture and grass. If I go down um, go down near the near the ground you can actually see uh, there's a lot of vegetation a lot of detail on that and also if I go near the signs you can see um, uh, the signs are uh, fairly high def definition as well and um, what I particularly like is the texture on the runways and taxiways um, today's a bit of um, a dull day in terms of bright lighting um, certainly when you get towards the evening it's uh, it's a lot more impressive uh, or if it's been raining you get a lot of reflection uh, so just uh, let's just go towards the terminal building. Uh, we've got some military operations just on the right here. And then as we get near the main terminal, we've got some um, commercial um, aviation aircraft just sitting there at the terminal. Uh, and I sometimes park here, um, this position here. It uh, looks like a... A uh, good place for a private jet to go um, and not too far away from the terminal building. Um, and then to the south side, I think it's the south, uh, we have uh, the GA operations. Um, and I haven't been to Albuquerque in my life, but I'm pretty sure these are accurate. Uh, and I quite like starting from uh, this location as well, uh, which is Eclipse um, Aerospace, I think it is. 
And then just to the south there, we've got some cargo operations as well. And you can also see, actually, I'm just going to pan across the landscape. You can see that um, the airport itself actually sat higher than the main city. Um, and so maybe it's not so clear from this point, but um, there is a bit of a ridge. It's sitting on an elevation, um, which you notice as you're on short file for the um, eastern runway. Um, main runway is about 13,000 feet. It's a very, very good length. Um, so absolutely perfect for almost any aircraft. Uh, but it is higher up. It's 5,300 feet, I think, uh, which means that you uh, will get slightly less performance from an aircraft um, on takeoff and landing. You're going to use a little bit more runway. OK, just hop into the aircraft now. Um, I All I have done is... Um, is I've, I've done the pre the external pre-flight. I I'd normally automate that because I, I just find it dull trying to do that by clicking uh, on everything. You always miss something on there. Um, what I'm going to do, as I say, we're going to fly from Albuquerque to Telluride. Um, so the two very high airfields by elevation. Um, you'll particularly notice that um, on the approach into Telluride. Um, and it's it's not um it's not the most forgiving approach. There's um, lots of mountains around. The runway is seven thousand feet, which in theory is way within the limits of this aircraft. But when you scale that up to nine thousand feet, actually, it's not very much runway space, and you really do have to nail the speed. Uh, if you end up high and fast, or even just on the right approach track and fast, you're in trouble um, because it's the air so thin. Even throwing the speed brakes are not going to really slow you very much. Um, and this approach procedure is not that great either. It involves a, a U-turn, basically, very shortly uh, beyond the end of the runway. OK, where do we start? Well, um, I haven't planned anything. Um, and the reason for that is because I'm using Navigraph charts, uh, which they've recently updated. And I've been testing um, the, the prototype um, and uh, enjoying using that. Um, I did have four flight. I haven't renewed my, my subscription to that. Uh, but no, Navigraph Charts just has gone in leaps and bounds. I'm very happy with that. Um, using Simbrief for planning. And one thing I really like about Simbrief, and you guys probably know this, but it's just so ac how accurate it is for fuel planning. Um, I don't even bother with extra fuel because it builds in contingencies. It says you're going to arrive with, say, 2.4 tonnes of fuel and you will arrive with 2.4 or 2.5 tonnes or maybe 2.6. Um, it hasn't let me down yet and hopefully it won't do on this flight. Um, what we're going to do is, uh, as I say, it's a short flight. It's about 200 miles. Um, we're going to, I'm going to just do all the planning and start up and everything from scratch um, so it's a bit of a demonstration of Navigraph charts. Um, if you if you fly simulators as an enthusiast, um, and I would say you spend ten hours or more a month, it's a no brainer. It's about seventy five euros or so, maybe about eighty five dollars a year. Um, that includes the um, flight management computer updates, um, and actually I think they would do one soon, uh, which means you can fly with the latest data. Um, and it gives you Jefferson charts. It's absolutely fantastic. Okay, um, let us, um, let's just set the aircraft up. Um, I normally start with everything off, cold and dark as they call it. Um, one thing I've done is I've gone through the aircraft flight manual, um, which is here. Um, not there actually. Which is here. Um, and this is... Um, over a thousand pages, um, and it has absolutely every single detail. So this is a this is the proper manual. This is not for flight simulator users. But what's important here is um, is the performance data that we'll we'll need in order to set our V speeds and everything. Plus, also to make sure that we can get in and out of Telluride. As I say, it's a seven thousand foot runway. That soon becomes a lot shorter when you start factoring in um, things like um, the elevation. Um, I'm going to just run through the checklist. I've actually gone through the normal procedures from this manual and created my own version of the checklist. And I'll, um, I will upload that at some point so you can 
have a look and use that if you wish. Uh, I don't tend to use the checklist in the aircraft um, because it's a bit more thorough and actually explains uh, a little bit um, about the cockpit and some of the controls that the main checklist seems to skip over. I am, however, using an abridged version of even my own checklist um, because there's certain safety checks that you do with some of the warning systems that just take a very long time and sometimes I just want to get back in the air as soon as possible. So let us start with that and we can what we can do is we can um, get the power on the aircraft, uh, we can do the planning, work out how much fuel we need, get that uploaded, um, then, then we can um, uh, load the plan in Navigraph charts and we can get going. So let us get into the cockpit. Okay, I'm gonna run through the checklist now. Um, now you do always have the option of external power, which is great, um, but I tend to like to just start with the APU, um, auxiliary power unit, and you know, obviously that burns some fuel, but it's not a huge amount. Um, you know, here at Albuquerque, if you were um, at this particular location, you probably wouldn't have any power to plug into. Um, so let's just run through the check. So stand my instruments on and it comes up there, the battery's on. Um, external power you can connect if we want, so I'm not going to do that. Um, have a quick look at the CAS messages, career alerting system messages. Um, at just at a glance I can tell they're fairly normal, there's nothing untoward there. At this light, um, the alert light um, is warning, it flashes all the time. Um, it, I'll click it to reset it and it will it'll flash again at some point. Um, let's have a look down here. So we stick the nav lights on. I have modified the checklist um, from the normal procedures. Just change the order of some of the things. Normally put the no smoking signs on as well at that point. Left and right fuel pump switches, they start in the auto position uh, I think this checklist, I think the flight manual is actually quite a bit older than this version of the aircraft. So we've got that on there. Next point is to start the APU. Uh, it is important to make sure you've done the external pre-flight and all the covers have been removed uh, at this point. And what I'm going to do as well is open the door. You can really hear the APU whirring up there. Okay, and the next bit is to um, is to switch over to the APU bleed, so we're taking air off the APU, and we're going to use that to start the engines as well when we come to that point. Put the cross bleed on, and the air source, basically what this means is our air is coming through the APU uh, into the aircraft system, so we can use that for air conditioning, etc., uh, without having the engines running. Cross bleed open air source is normal. So next we just check the standby instruments are readable and normal. Clock. I just reset the stopwatch on there if we need it. I normally change to UTC time um, because in aviation that is the only time. Uh, notice while steering is off. Uh, and then FF. S. Now this is the bit where we'll we'll do our flight planning because uh, at this stage we're going to need to um, plan our route and our departure and arrival into Telluride um, and we can also put our transponder code in and any other information that we've got, um, tune ILS and that sort of thing. So let's switch over to SimBrief. And as I say, I'm doing this from scratch. So I'm going to put in our departure ABQ um, and KTEX, great um, ICAO code for Telluride. Now let's just say the session's expired, so that's fine. Okay, and it's also better to put um, an alternate in there, um, so that's fine. There's not a lot we need to do on here. Um, I've set up the Challenger as one of the airframe profiles. And really the rest of it is just um, choosing a particular route. Um, and there's not really much more to choose on here, but it's got our um, climb profile, 
uh, cruise profile, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then down here, the en route time, departure runway 08, arrival at 27. Um, we will actually check because actually all the approaches are into 09 at Telluride, um, which means that we'll end up on an approach into 09 if we're IFR. Um, if it's good weather, um, then we can um, we can just cancel IFR, fly VFR and land 09, uh, sorry, land 27 if it's worthwhile. Um, I'm not going to book any more fuel, uh, it's fine as is. Passengers, we can say full. Cargo, no cargo. Um, and then down to the route itself. Uh, the route is planning, it's a short flight. Um, this route is 235 nautical miles. Um, this is the uh, RSK, it's a VOR rattlesnake, VOR into ETL. That's absolutely fine. That's absolutely fine. Uh, there's only one airway route here, which is the Victor 361, and that will be a up to 16 or 18,000 feet. Um, we want to. We don't have time really to go much above that, but um, I, I don't really look sitting there at 16,000 really. And then on the map that shows you the path itself. Um, so we fly to the Albuquerque VOR, and then up to Rattlesnake. And RTL is the um, is a fix near. Telluride, and that is the start of all the approaches. And then K Pub, I have no idea what that um, uh, Publico um, Pueblo um, is the alternate near Colorado Springs. It's, you may as well actually looking at it, you may as well just fly back to Albuquerque. Um, so that's fine. That's fine. I, I, I will come clean with you. I don't tend to put alternates in on these short flights, um, which is which is a bit naughty. Um, let's uh, say, ha say we're happy with that and save it. And as I should say, I've not done one of these flights for, a, um, not recorded one of these flights for a very long time. So I do apologize if you are a subscriber and I do promise to do more of these. It's just um, actually get, getting the time to actually do the recording versus I'll just do a quick flight and not record it. Um, but today I decided to bite the bullet and just get get going and start recording again uh, but there have been a lot of changes since the last time I've been um, been recording these um, Simbrief I was using before Navigraph charts I've been using before but Navigraph is, is substantially improved and uh, I can't really wait to um, to show you that uh, if you're not already familiar with it uh, they've been doing a lot of publicity around their changes and when I when I was in their user testing I um, was listening to all the changes, I think this is um, really giving ForeFlight a run for its money from a simulator flight simmer's perspective. Um, and uh, I've got to say, it's um, I'm quite happy with it. I, I don't really miss ForeFlight completely. Um, there's bits like the synthetic vision and things that, uh, if you look at my other flights, um, you know, it's quite handy. And the extra information you get from ForeFlight is really useful. But it's not aimed at simmers, it's aimed at GA pilots. Whereas Navigraph Charts is just a flight simmers tool. Uh, so we saved the flight in SimBrief. I'm going to generate the flight plan. And let that wear away in the background. Um, now, one thing that's really changed actually is um, the integration really with SimBrief um, into Navigraph Charts um, and the automation that it brings. So one of the things that has cropped up is this SimBrief downloader. And basically what this does, it takes plans that you've put into SimBrief and it will it will export automatically to um, your aircraft or the other tools that you might be using, some of the navigation tools. So for example, um, I've asked it to export PDF document of the flight plan and then into explains default directory. Uh, this means anything that uses the built-in FMS and the um, Challenger 300 in um, Xplane uses the Xplane FMS. Um, it will automatically be um, something I can just pick up, just makes it very quickly. All I have to do is just click the export button. And I've chosen for it to just export to the Xplane directory. Uh, we'll pick that up on the flight management computer in a minute and also the PDF of the route and I'm going to pick that up on a tablet um, that um, I'm using for Navigraph charts. That's all we have to do there. So happy with that. Simbrief can go. Um, anything I will do 
is just I'm just going to go to my R Cloud Drive and and yeah, it's there. It's fine. Sometimes it it doesn't generate the uh, flight plan until you go and look at it, which is, seems a bit odd. Uh, but now it's there, actually. I'm, I'm pretty well done. I can actually close SimBrief down on my main computer. Um, <laughs> hesitantly. Um, that will now be something I can pick up from straight in the flight sim. So let's do that. So click on the um, index button if you're not already there. Route menu. The company route. And we want to look for KABQ as our starting point. Now I have done... I have done some other flights here um, from ABQ, although I actually did clear it out recently. That should be that one. And that's automatically loaded in now. It's a very, very short flight, as you can see, just three entries in there, uh, which is nothing. Um, so really, the next stage will be to look at the detail from SimBrief, and I'm going to do that on the tablet. So I've got Navigraph charts display at the moment showing the current position of the aircraft. Um, I've got the world map view, uh, which is one of the three views you can put. The other two are IFR views, either low or high en route charts. Um, I, I prefer this because when you're using the flight management computer, it's nice to just see some of the terrain that you'll fly near. Plus, the other thing about this, compared with ForeFlight, is the default view on this is actually very uncluttered. ForeFlight blessing its heart is is great for information but sometimes you need to just trim back what you're looking at in order to get that beautiful sort of um, clear clean view at the moment there's nothing in here um, I haven't set up any any flights um, what I'm going to show you having exported all of that it can actually pick that flight up automatically from SimBrief uh, and there's a, um, a way you can integrate SimBrief with Navigraph charts so all you do is click on flights uh, click on new flight and then say from SimBrief and just check it says use KABQ to KTEX it will pick up on the last OFP file that SimBrief created as I say you do need to integrate it you need a subscription with um, you obviously need a Navigraph subscription in order to do this I don't think that will work with any trial um, but that is now being loaded in uh, it's a very it's a fairly trivial route uh, but it's already loaded in there, so we can have a quick look. And you can see uh, we are, uh, just zoom out a little bit, and you can see the route there. Um, it's not completely direct line, but it's uh, um, it's it's about 20% further distance. Um, so the next thing that we need to do is have a look at the information from SimBrief. This has just got our plan as is. Uh, so that's going to iCloud, there it is, that's the file, just open that as a PDF. Um, so that's the SimBrief um, uh, detail there. Um, so there's lots of things we get from here that we're going to need. Um, one of the things is the flight level, uh, which is showing it as um, 0400, that's uh, flight level 400. So I'm going to just start by putting that as the cruise altitude. Um, just click here. 400. Now that may be ambitious because um, it's a, a fairly short flight. We'll update that en route as necessary. Um, what else do we need from here? Um, for, you know, for non airliners, there's not a huge amount, but uh, one thing that's absolutely crucial here is our block fuel. Uh, so, what, what, what does that mean? Well, the, the, the fuel we need for a flight is the trip fuel plus contingencies, a bit of flight um, fuel to go to your alternate, which is worked out here. Your final reserves, which is the fuel that you're hoping to have in the tanks after you've maybe gone, gone to your alternative, give you a minimum takeoff fuel, um, and then any extra fuel you've booked, and I haven't booked any, so our takeoff fuel, 3879, and this is pounds by the way, I've actually configured uh, SimBrief to give us pounds, not kilos, and that's partly because this aircraft prefers pounds than kilos, and I want it all in the same format. Um, it's also allowing 200 pounds of fuel burn for our taxi um, at APQ, um, which actually is, is quite um, reasonable. Um, so what you need to do is you need to make sure that when you're ready to take off that you're at 3879. If you have any less than that, then you have to make a decision. Obviously, 
um, you know, some of the, there'll, there'll be legal requirements about the amount of fuel that they have. But we're going to actually request the fuel now. So it's £4,079 or something nearby. So let's just do that from the menu here. Um, and in some cases you have, I mean, that's not very much fuel. Sometimes you already have more than that. In this case, I don't. Um, I've got about half that. So let's just move up to 4079 or something near it. Okay, that'll do 4,141. Uh, I like the way it actually tells you the flight time. It's, it's not very accurate at that time. Click done and apply. And just make sure in the main instrument display, yes, we do have our fuel there. Now that will obviously be consumed as our APU is running. Um, but as long as we have 3879 on takeoff, we're absolutely fine. And once again, this little warning sign up again. Okay, so we need to, um, we've got the flight plan into the FMS. I need to just um, um, look at the departures and arrivals now. Now, you can either do that manually uh, based on the weather conditions, or um, actually, if you look at the route down here on the Simbrief log, uh, it's giving us a Largo 3 departure to Rattlesnake and the arrival at KTEX. Um, it says runway 27, there's no star and there's no approach. Um, no, they would never give you the approach, but if there was a star, it would give you that. Uh, that would be an arrival. Uh, let's put the departure on for Largo 3. So this would be because that we've look at the weather at the time. If you run a flight plan um, that you've done before, you, you shouldn't reuse that because obviously that uh, may have changed with the weather. Um, but you can load the flight plan, regenerate the OFP file, which is your flight plan file. That's which that's what everything hangs off, and then you can use that data. So departure from Albuquerque. Um, it's the Largo 3, although, yeah, of course, um, it's going to complain I haven't selected the runway. It says 08, so it's our easterly runway Largo 3. And what's our transition? It's RSK, Rattlesnake VOR. And execute that and just clear. And then the next stage will be the arrival onto uh, KTEX. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick in localizers 09 we can't select um a 27 approach because there isn't one so we'll say localizer e uh, 09 and etl is our transition so that's absolutely fine execute that and let's have a look at what how that's impacted our legs um so we depart from runway 08 to albuquerque vor and then these are all our routes up to um rsk and um, now one thing they've changed on Navigraph charts, which is fantastic, is they allow us to overlay stars um, onto the map. So we've got the Largo 3, um, 0, 8, and there's a button here, click, and it will overlay that, and we can actually pin that as well. Um, that will overlay onto the map. Oh, that doesn't seem to be doing it. Let me just do it from here. There we go. It's overlaying the, the uh, that particular chart on the on the map, so you can actually see it in context. Now, it doesn't do that with everything. The map has to be a scale map, so um, the stars and SIDs um, and the um, the approaches should all be to scale. But sometimes they're not. If they're not, then it will not overlay on here. You'll just be able to see it um, on its own. Uh, but that's not normally a problem. Or sometimes you have a star it's in scale, but then one of the features to get it onto the map, they said this is actually not, this part of the map is not to scale. Um, so you can see the route here. So we go to Albuquerque, uh, to Hanos, Rattlesnake, and then um, we'll, we'll load up the approach to go into um, Telluride. Um, so we've got that part in there, and then uh, KTEX up here. Uh, let's have a look at the approaches. Now we don't have an approach loaded here at the moment, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open all of the charts for Telluride um, and um, I'm going to try the RNAV approach, I think. We can actually have a look at what that is. So we're up at ETL. And it's very simple, really, from ETL. I go straight into the hold, if you wish, um, or you can turn and go to SETMA 
uh, for the RNAV. The only, the only thing is there's no uh, there's no glyso if you choose the ILS approach, um, so that is something you have to do manually. Whereas with the RNAV approach, there is a, a glyso guidance, um, so that's why I prefer that there. Um, and as I say, it's a fairly hair raising place. So I'm going to pin that, so a little pin icon, adds it to the bottom. Uh, the other thing we want, of course, is taxi. Um, the taxi chart for Telluride, and actually while we're at it, gets um, the Albuquerque um, chart there as well. And we've got the got the Largo ready, I think. Let's just have a look. Okay, it's playing around now. Well, there we go. Largo's pin, so the pin, the sort of vertical pin, shows that. Okay, and um, taxi's pinned as well. Okay, great. Oh, there, there we go. The bottom wasn't updating there. So we've got the airport, got our instrument departure, we've got our approach into um, to Telluride and the airport plan. So um, now, because we've set the altitude up in the plan, um, it'll actually give us our top of descent point, 122 miles. It says the destination's 312 miles, so um, it's, a, it's a little bit further um, than we would um, than the direct line, obviously. Um, so that's all set up. I think we are um, fairly ready to go. Um, so what I normally do is I'll have the airport diagram uh, set up, and it shows us there at the laser facility near the eastern end of the runway, which is quite um, uh, quite convenient. Uh, the only thing is that if we're taking off zero 08, and it's quite a long taxiway, taxi rides two miles or so, um, because we're at the wrong end for that. I'm going to have a look at the winds, though, and see what they're doing, because there's a number of things we need to set up. Um, so let's go ahead and um, we've got the ATIS on here. Um, now, one thing I find it's much easier putting in the ATIS and NAV and, and transponder codes via the FMS. So that's 118.0. And we'll put that up on COM2 as the main one. And while we're at it, let's get the ATIS for Telluride, which is 11832, and put that onto the recall on COM2. Um, what else do we need? Well, we're not using the ILS, so we won't bother with that. Might have the squawk code here. Let's make something up randomly. So 1707. And we'll stick that in there as well. And that's quite handy to be able to just type it in. Otherwise, it's a little bit fiddly with the controls down here on the main screen. I I'd like to know, actually, how you would do that in the real aircraft. Um, whether there's buttons or something that you can use, I don't know. Okay. So let us get going. Um, now, the other thing that we haven't done yet is setting our um, initial climb altitude, which normally will be given in our clearance. Uh, we're not speaking to anyone here. So let's just have a quick look at the instrument departure and see if there's any restrictions. Uh, it says 15,000, 15,000. So, um, Bear in mind, it's already 5,000, so that's uh, only 10,000 higher. That's set up 15,000 as our altitude. That'll be our initial one. Okay, and so what I can do now is hopefully we've got the ATIS all tuned in, so we click COM2 button and we can listen to the Albuquerque one. Albuquerque International Sunport Information Uniform 1500 Zulu Weather. Wind calm. Visibility more than 10. Sky conditions 9,000 view. 18,000 scattered. Temperature 21. Dew point 13. Altimeter 3021. Arriving runway 03. 08. Departing runway 08. Advise on initial contact you have uniform. Okay, it's information uniform. Um, so one thing I've got is the wind's calm. So I'm going to request to be able to part runway 26. Um, because it will avoid several minutes taxiing and then take off in the wrong direction and several minutes flying in the wrong direction. Um, they should be able to accommodate us um, under the circumstances. Um, and then that sends us straight to Albuquerque, um, and then obviously from there 
uh, we just uh, pick up on the route. So um, the next thing to do will be to um, let's have a quick look at Telluride's uh, weather. So KTEX, we'll put it into the little built-in pad here and have a look. So we've got, um, uh, let's have a look. Um, so light rain, um, 30, 44, it's normally higher pressure than here. Um, okay, yeah, nothing really to worry. It's, the wind is light, so we can easily do our um, land on easterlies. Um, 8,000 broken, overcast 11,000. Um, okay, that's good. I normally fly with real weather, uh, but I find actually in most parts of the states it's, it's better than um, better than what it's not that challenging. So sometimes I'll override it, stick some really grotty weather in, and um, and su suffice with that. Now I live in Britain, and normal weather is marginal VFR at best um, a lot of the time. So um, you know that's that's one of the things. Um, so. Unbelievably, that was all a um, bit of my intro, a bit of introduction to Navigraph um, is all just one checklist item. Normally, it'd be a lot quicker than that. So let's whiz through the rest of it and get going. So FMS is complete. Um, left and right window sh shield heats on. Actually, I'm just going to switch the um, tablet off there. Um, right, now we need to set the landing altitude. Um, now, to do that, we need the instruments up. So I'll just grab that. I'd like to put this um, little thing down in the bottom here and just manage the panels a little bit. Now it's built into the aircraft but it's in a very awkward position, it's just down here. So it's much better with the floating panel. Um, zoom in a little bit and I normally use the right hand instrument panel for it. Bring up the summary screen and you see on there it says landing altitude. So let's set that up. It's 9,000, I'm going to set 9,050. Now, a really weird thing happens when you land at Telluride, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that when it actually happens, but it's because it's so high, it really fools the system a little bit. So that's setting our landing altitude. If you want to know where to get that, that is from the airport plan, and, you know, runways are never completely flat, got an elevation at both ends, so 9,050 is kind of the midpoint. Um, the reason it needs that is because to work out the pressurisation, um, it's going to make sure as it depressurises the aircraft that it reaches your ambient actual altitude, um, cabin altitude when you land there, and that's partly the thing that throws it. Uh, next thing is lights. Um, just test the instrument lights, the emergency lights, and it comes up with a warning, say emergency lights are on, and then we put it into arm. Uh, the next thing, hydraulics, um, I'm actually going to switch all the hydraulics on after we started. There is a safety thing here as well with hydraulics. If you switch on the hydraulics too early, um, there's potential danger if, you, if someone was um, standing near one of the control surfaces and you move the aileron or something, it, it would actually activate that flight control. Um, so you tend to switch the hydraulics on just before you start taxiing, ideally. Um, just to make sure the parking brake is set though, and it is. Um, trim system as well. I'm going to uh, just check the main pilot trim. So what I like to do with this aircraft is to set it about 7.2. That seems to work out really well. Normally the, the co-pilot right hand seat would check theirs as well. Um, and then we go down, there's an ELT check, we'll skip that, DC and AC power switches. Well, we can switch the cabin lights on, I think. I was thinking actually, you know, in the context, this could be a positioning flight, um, but you still go through some of the same procedures. The other thing is animations, it's uh, undo the blinds, cabin lights are on, everything is okay. And in fact, I've got a view sitting here in one of the rear seats, and that's what you'd see. Um, altimeters I've set 3021, 5, it corresponds to uh, what you have at Albuquerque, so that's good. Uh, next thing is to take off data. Spend a bit of time just going through this. It's a short flight, but it's um, it's one that's a bit more challenging in terms of that. So let's have a look at the manual. So what we do is we need to work out what our V1, VR, and V2 speeds are, and enter those in here. So with, with the manual it's going into the takeoff charts and uh, it's not 
just a matter of saying, okay, well, this is, these are the speeds to use. It varies. Um, let's have a look at this. So uh, first of all is whether it's wet or dry. Well, it's obviously dry today. Um, it's flat to 10 degrees. That would be the standard takeoff flap. Uh, the difference is if you set 20 degrees, you can actually take off in slightly less runway space if you need to. We have absolutely no need to do that today. Um, next question is um, engine bleeds on or off. Basically, the bleed will take some of the power from the engine to feed the air system. Normally, um, with airliners, they keep it switched off for takeoff just so you get the full power. And we'll do that today, even though there's absolutely no need to. Um, and then we need to look at the weight um, of the aircraft. So we're going to be uh, very light. So I've only set the minimum fuel, 28 tonnes. Um, can't remember what the temperature, I think it was about 20 degrees or so. Um, the only thing is this is the sea level chart. So we need to go down to the 9,000 foot chart, uh, which is there. And let's just get a rectangle. And we can say, well, 28 tonnes. 20 degrees and that is our takeoff data so we've got 111 113 and 122 as our v1 vr v2 speeds we need 5410 feet and that allows a certain amount of clearance um, so we're more than adequately covered but that's a lot that's a lot more space than you need at um, some of the airfields that are obviously much lower um, one thing about the speeds though is a note down here uh, no corrections are required where minimum V1 and VR is 116. Um, so that's why there's a grey background there. It says ignore the lowest speed here, set 116. And funnily enough, that is exactly what it's set here. So 116 for V1, um, VR at set 120, well, we can leave that. And then 127 is normally 10 knots, um, about 10 knots above V1. Um, so that's absolutely fine, we'll leave it as is. So that is the, um, that is the data that we're going to use for takeoff today. Uh, there is corrections as well, if you've got strong headwind or if the runway's uphill slightly, there's corrections. But you know what, um, <laughs> to be honest, it doesn't vary that much. Um, it doesn't really that vary that much. Um, you know, once you've got the altitude set in here. So the other thing would be the um, landing weights. And it's quite important, really, because of where we're going. So we have to sort of navigate the this huge thousand page document um, and have a look at the dry and wet landing runway data, approach speeds and landing distances. This is thankfully a much more condensed chart. I've actually already got this from my last Telluride flight. Um, so it's 9,000 foot, the elevation, VREF113, that's the uh, threshold speed, 119 is the go around, and then the actual runway needed is 2790, but the field length um, for landing is 4640, so that will factor in any obstacles, uh, and then if it's wet, slightly more. So actually, we're well within that, it's about 7,000 foot at Telluride, so that's fine. Again, there could be some corrections. I'm not going to bother with that. Let's get on with this flight, though. So we're satisfied that um, we can get in um, into Telluride and we can get out of Albuquerque. So let's continue with the checks. So at this point, we would set the, um, the takeoff data, but um, it's absolutely fine as is. One thing I will do is set the navigation source to FMS, which means it will be driven from my navigation computer. Um, and this point we're going to close the door, so let's do an external view and we'll close this thing. There's the door closing. And parking brake, just make sure that's set, which is great. Um, and then the um, thrust levers, as well, I always give them a bit of a check, particularly on a computer simulator because they can be a bit twitchy. And that's working fine. Uh, we'll switch the strobe lights on because we're about to start up. And then the engine start run switches can go in. Uh, one thing you'll notice actually is um, our spoilers have been deployed. And if I just 
shift the throttles forward and backwards that gets rid of them um, so that's fine let's clear this thing and start our engine so hold it for a few seconds Okay, that's started nicely, so that's good. Uh, so we're looking for the green figures here. I'll start the other side. And the other thing is, as the engines start, you'll see lights going off here, and you get used to what you should see there and what you shouldn't see there. Um, funnily enough, some some of these indicators and buttons actually light up when they're off or light up when they're on. It just doesn't make any sense. You think, well, why didn't they design this so it's consistent? But funnily enough, actually, when you're in the cruise and everything's as normal, there's no lights on. So actually, that makes complete sense. Okay, so our engines are running now. Um, so the next thing to do here would be to switch on our hydraulics. So actually, I, for some reason, had one of the hydraulics already on. Okay, the rest of the hydraulics are on now. And we can just have a quick look on the hydraulics page to make sure everything's in the green. In fact, we can just cycle through uh, the electrics. Um, so we're currently on APU still. Um, and then the ECS is the air system there. And you see we're currently not taking bleeds from the engine. If we were, you see the green would go up, indicating we've got air from the engine. We're taking it from the APU at the moment. And we'll keep those bleeds off until we're we've taken off. Um, wing anti-ice is the next one. Um, so I think on the rail aircraft you switch this on it wouldn't just show up green it would take time to warm up so the idea is you give it a bit of time to do that. We'll select flaps for takeoff which is 10 degrees. Again we'd have to make sure that um, people are away from the aircraft for safety reasons. Uh, and then flight controls so we'll bring up the flight controls page. and. I'm just testing the ailerons and the elevators and make sure they're operating the correct way and also our rudder and while we're at it we can test the spoilers as well and that's all testing out well um, we could check ground spoilers, we're going to skip that uh, just check our um, ECAS um, messages up here uh, so we still have the wing anti-ice on that we know, um, parking brakes on, cross bleeds open, we'll have that switched off and take off and nose wheel steering is currently off still and that will go on just before we start taxiing. Um, anti-ice panel, uh, we, there's some checks that we can do here but I'm just going to say I'm happy with that. On the page it's greened up so we can turn it off, um, funnily enough we don't need it at Albuquerque very often. Um, and then going down um, aircraft lighting, this is the point we put the fasten seatbelt sign on. Um, taxi light can come on as well. Uh, nose wheel steering, switch that on, and then parking brake release when we're ready to taxi. Okay, so we've got our taxi clearance. We can switch this thing off for the moment and clear that. Okay, holding on the foot brakes. The very first thing to do, obviously, is start taxiing and do a quick check of the brakes both sides. So, captain and first officer would do that. Now this is a very short taxi because we're going to request zero at 8, we're more or less there. One thing we do test is the reverse thrusters at this point. So I'd like to get a little bit of speed up and then to idle and then full reverse and green, reverse idle and reverse stowed. Okay, just check the trim and flap set 7.2 on the trim, 10 degree flap is what we want. Um, takeoff data is set, so we're happy with that. Um, the, the nav equipment, we've set the nav source to FMS and that's in the enunciator. Takeoff briefing, well it's just a departure straight out to the Albuquerque BOR and then as planned. We set 15,000 foot up, we've got the altimeter set as well, so we're happy. Actually with this we're um, slightly beyond the end of the runway, we have to taxi um, to the threshold. 
What else do we have? Transponder, well that can come on now. And then anti-ice if we need it, which we don't obviously today. So next checks will be the lineup checks. And so you typically do this as you get your clearance for takeoff. Um, so good opportunity to just go through our um, checks for uh, our um, takeoff data. So it hasn't started raining, hasn't, um, hasn't started snowing, so we're not going to need any anti-ice. Um, nothing's changed since then. Okay, as we are cleared for takeoff, and it's our turn to the right here. Um, cross please can be closed, so let's do that. The probes can come on. The landing lights can come on, and our strobes can come on. Just keep an eye on it. Transponder, um, that will go to TARA, so we appear on everyone's radar. And we're ready. CAS messages, um, oh, white pro P. No apologies. Yeah, the CAS messages should be clear at that point. So we're cleared to take off. Just a quick check on the left and right, and there's nothing seen, so we can continue. And that's the pre takeoff checks complete. So we have a massive, massive runway here. So we should be airborne very, very quickly. Let's power up, get the takeoff power set. There it is. Engine instruments green. Air speed alive. Eighty knots. V1, rotate, positive right gear up, and just lock the attitude hold and that will allow the airspeed to build up a bit, looking up for our flat retraction speed. I'm going to switch to nav mode now, it's in roll and pitch, and that will send us off to Albuquerque, um, which is 10 miles away. And next thing is also set the climb power from takeoff power slightly reduced. Pass V1, uh, the flap 1 ret uh, retraction speed, so the flaps can come up and do the after takeoff checks. So landing gear is up, the flaps are up, the nose wheel light can come off. Anti ice panel as required, bleeds can go on now, and we can switch the APU off as well. And so we continue. So the next checks will be as we pass through. 18,000. You have to be very careful with the speed of this aircraft because it will absolutely hammer through the 250. Not really a problem here because we're going to be about 10,000 feet, uh, but you wouldn't believe how quickly you can overspeed this aircraft. And there's us on the chart as well. I'm just going to give us a little bit of acceleration as we approach the turning point. We've got to about 300 knots. Thousand feet to go. There's the turn. It's a bit murky up here. Uh, Fifteen thousand feet. 
some of that speed build up to just bring the power back a little bit. And I'll stick to 300 knots. Um, just having a quick look, we're in cloud at the moment. Let's get the wing and engine anti ice on because we are minus one. And then we'll say that we've been cleared up to 300, flight level 300. So we'll do flight level change now and just add a little bit of power. There we go, 300. And our cruise is 400 today. Let's climb past set. Okay, we're at, we're in a sort of layer between two cloud layers um, so we can leave the anti-ice on. Uh, it's obviously not going to get any warmer. Normally I would shut the um, privacy blind as well, though in this case we don't have any one in the back. So past 18,000 we do the um, flight level checks, so altimeter to standard barometer 2992. Landing lights can come off now. And then we can review whether we take the passenger seatbelt sign off as we're in cloud. We'll uh, leave that on until we've broken clear, um, comfortable with it's smooth, um, smooth conditions. Now, something else I can check here is see how far off our track we are looks like we're dead on and you see it's cross track arrow zero sometimes particularly if you're flying faster than the speed they think you're flying when they do the planning you end up busting through it and you can actually get to a point where it just never captures that path um, it's something that navigraph is great for because you can check to see where you are but um, it's um, in the real aircraft having a look at the progress page will actually give you a cross track error now the other thing we need to do is it's a fairly short flight um, and you can see we're good to flight level 400 until Hanos which is 40 nautical miles and then from Rattlesnake, somewhere between Hanos and Rattlesnake, uh, we need to be at 350 at Rattlesnake so um, what we can do is have a look at the progress page and it tells us the top of descent 89 miles so we're going to be beyond Hanos and nearly at Rattlesnake before we start to descend. It's only five, it's only five thousand feet to descend, um, so we'll probably do that in about two minutes. Um, let's switch the wing and engine anti-ice off now. Now it's nice and smooth. We don't have anyone in the back, but just go through the process of turning all of that off. The other thing to do is um, we can switch our um, COM2 to Telluride. Um, doubt we'll hear anything from this far out, which we won't. I uh, don't like leaving that on though, because it's really distracting if it suddenly fires up into um, full audio when you don't expect it. Now one thing is you approach um, flight level 300, we're about um, 4,000 feet away from that, is you start needing to manage that speed a bit. You'll see that our climb performance uh, to maintain 300 knots indicated is 2,000 feet a minute. Um, that is absolutely fine, um, but it will start dropping off fairly quickly. And what we need to do is we need to um, change our flight change speed, um, which basically is the speed at which you're climbing. Otherwise, we're just never going to get there. So 300 is good for now, but as we approach 300, you'll still be making some changes to that. 
do have a little bit of a tailwind, a bit of a crosswind and a tailwind, so that's always very welcome. And you see the landscape, it's absolutely beautiful, uh, the way it's modelled in this. Uh, so this uses the orthographic Ortho 4XP um, add-on, uh, which is free, um, well worth it. Certainly in this neck of the woods, really, really good. I've never been to this part of the world, um, this specific state, um, but I can imagine this is fairly faithfully reproduced here. So the other thing we could check is what our fuel, what fuel we should have at Hanos, just to make sure we're not burning more than we thought. So Hanos. 3.1 tons and we are at 3.5 so we're actually fine which is great also note the cabin altitude uh, it's always going to be a lot less than our outside altitude um, it's the whole point of pressurization and we want to see that what happens when we get to telluride so just about approaching our leveling of off altitude we will actually put that up again and keep flight change on so we've put that up to 400 which is our final destination this is the way it would typically work they wouldn't give you your final cruise altitude from the get-go you'd just be stepped up as you're in and out of uh, as you climb higher you tend to get into less dense traffic So 10 from Hainos now, and you see our climb performance has diminished a bit, but also see the um, speed limit um, has come down as well. We're very near to that now, so what I'm going to do is just notch down the speed at which we're climbing, put it down to 290, and that gives us an immediate burst of climb energy, but that will quickly pitter out. So this flight change mode basically holds the speed and adjusts the nose to maintain its speed. It's very, very handy in flying. The other mode is vertical speed. That's very useful if you are um, trying to slow down or speed up or if you're trying to maintain a descent. For example, into Telluride, there's no glide slope. And so if you're on the ILS, you would probably set that up to mimic that, what that glide slope would be. So we've got a bit of a cross-track error, one and a half miles, but um, you can see it is actually has flown a bit of an intercept and that's actually reducing, so I'm happy with that. The danger is if you're too far away from that at your turning point, it will just continue. Uh, once again, some changes to the speed. It's come back to 280. There's no auto throttle by default in this aircraft, and I actually quite like that. Um, it, it makes it a little bit more interesting, you're a bit more involved. Actually, I, th I think it's um, auto throttle just takes the fun out of flying. And we're going to have to constantly be tweaking this because you can see that red bar is actually moving down rapidly. Now, even though on the flight management computer it says flight level 350, we've got a very, very long way to go before we need to start descending. The right thing to do is click on progress and look at the top of descent distance which is 44, that's set based on your cruise altitude you put in here, okay, which is what we're aiming for. If for some reason we decided to go higher or lower than that, we have to update it in here, otherwise the flight management computer doesn't know that you never made it up there. Uh, once again, we need to turn the speed back, um, bring that back to 265. So it really diminishes around the sort of flight level 350 and above and it's quite painful actually getting that final 10,000 feet. In this case we're only going up to flight level 400. So the other thing we can do is just check what fuel level we should have at Rattlesnake and that's 2.8 
2.8 tons, 2,800, and that's in pounds. So we're nowhere near it yet, but you can see we're well above it at the moment. We should be above it when we get there. So now we're in the cruise, or well, climb, final stage of the climb. Just a quick look through, all the lights are off and that's what you expect to see. It's a very, it is a simple aircraft to fly, but you know, you do have to invest a little bit of time. Um, the other thing is, uh, we're on weather mode on the radar at the moment. You see a little bit of um, activity to the east of us. Um, I'm going to switch over to terrain because that will be the thing that will affect us um, most in Telluride. we get to the top of climb, just like top of descent 25, so <laughs> it's going to keep us fairly busy uh, this old route, it's a very short route um, and we are going to need to work hard, there won't be any time to sit back and have a coffee. Now as you get to the top of the um, climb, speed doesn't go thundering up because the air is pretty thin, so I'm just going to bring this back to about 79 or so ish and this little bar oh, sorry if I'm um, teaching granny suck eggs but this little bar here shows your trend this little magenta bar which currently says you're kind of holding speed if we were we could just notch up a little bit you see it's moved slightly up so it says we're increasing so it's quite useful as a general reference in terms of whether you're holding at speed or not. Check progress for our top of descent, so 17. So that's going to be coming in about 20 miles or so from RSK. Uh, there's not a lot we need to do here. Um, what we'll do when we reach that top of descent point is stick it into VNAV mode um, and then flight level change and that will set our next descent point um, which will be the the larger altitudes in the flight management computer so it'll set it at 12,000 feet and the A means above we have to be above that. Let's have a look at the approach chart So the approach chart involves going to ETL and then to SETMA and that's the RNAV approach, although that doesn't correspond with what we have on here for some reason so I'm just going to have a check and see what we have for the arrival. Uh, we've got the localizer 09 that's why, that's my mistake, RNAV uh, 09 Yankee um, and that is via EDL. And um, we can say we can. Uh, there's no, we're not using any of these transition points, and that's because that's the Yankee approach. And this is the Zulu one, which is the one we're going to follow. And that's fine. And just see what's happened here now. So there's a discontinuity from Rattlesnake to ETL. So let's just change that, and then. We get to ETL and fly to SEPMA, which is on here, you see it on the uh, chart. Now the only thing to say about that is it will anticipate that turn a few miles before it, um, which means 
you'll end up with um, actually chopping that distance down quite to probably about half. And as it'll be in the descent, um, and talking about descent, we're top, two miles to the top of descent, as it'll be in the descent, if you're on so two and a half thousand foot descent rate, that'll suddenly go to five thousand foot descent rate, and that is not an acceptable amount. So we have to be a bit careful. What I will do is I'll fly heading mode when we get to ETL and give it a bit of a wider berth so it goes back through ETL into SEPMA. And there's our top of descent. Let's put it in VNAV mode and flight level change and it will obviously start, start, start descending immediately. I'm going to throw in almost full spoiler. I find about two thirds of full spoiler is about right just to hold the speed and you can see it's an it's 13,000 which is what we are meant to be at or above at 13,000 at ETL. Let's bring the spoiler back a little bit so that we're maintaining our speed still. I'm going to switch over to the airway view. And you see, it's this is partly the reason I don't use it, particularly for these short flights. We haven't really flown on any of the airways. We've just gone from one point to another, a more of a bespoke route. And you know, it looks the same whether this is Holland, where it's all flat, or you know, Colorado, where you're full of mountains. Um, it's going to look this. Um, it's just going to look the same. So I always like to. Um, put it on world map and it makes it a little bit more interesting. Now one thing you may notice is um, that blue marker that you see down here um, is tagging our descent speed, what we should be at, and that comes from this page here, it's our descent profile. So it's meant to be 0.74 Mach or 290 knots indicated. Um, in theory we should be bringing that speed back. I'm going to leave it as is for the moment. I, um, I need to change that. I don't like having to slow up so much um, for the descent. However, um, it, the knock-on effect of not going along with that is that the flight management computer is expecting to fly that speed um, and therefore we're going to end up getting places a lot quicker. Um, it's never really worried it to be honest so I'm not. I'm just going to leave it as is. But um, I would quite like to configure this aircraft so it descends at maybe 0.78 on Mac, uh, something similar to what we're doing right now. So let's check Telluride's ATIS again. Okay, getting nothing there. So what we can do is um, just have a look at the, um, the page for. KTEX and just update that for the latest weather. Light drizzle, uh, wind is light, so again we're fine landing easterlies, 3047 is the altimeter, the scattered 6000 scattered 7000, so that's not going to be a problem. 10 miles, great, perfect. You see that line below us, that's uh, another aircraft, that's the vapor trail for another aircraft. You can just about make make it out. <laughs> and as we go lower, you need to, if you want to maintain your speed, you need to start feeding in power. The air's getting a bit more dense. Not a huge amount at this point. So what I do is I put on one of the throttles. As I put both on, it would probably just go into overspeed. But as we get lower, just feeding a bit of power to maintain that speed um, that, that you're expecting. So 
So there's our view uh, from the rear, and then I've set up some wing views on the left and right. It's always rather nice. And then all the other views um, are from the cockpit, so it's my standard view there. My first officer's view. This is my sort of generic um, instrument view, although it's, it's got a bit screwed up. <laughs> It's, it's because the, uh, we've got the curtain closed. And then I've got a view which is my close-up of my instruments. And then I've got my uh, left and my right view. So that seems to work quite well. So we can see the um, cloud layer below, so the one consideration there will be some anti-ice, but I'm going to leave it until we're much, much nearer, because what can happen is you suddenly find that you just go through a hole in it and you don't really need to prep the wings or the engines for um, ice protection. have a quick look at the approach again. So as I say, when we get to ETL, we're going to go past that and then do a left turn to come back through it um, and then aim towards SEPMA. And then once we get to SEPMA, we're more or less on the descent profile for uh, runway 09 at um, Telluride. Uh, missed approach is a climbing right turn to 15,000 direct to ETL and then hold. Um, but we won't need to do that, I'm sure. Um, the decision altitude, well, 1602 feet above the runway level is 10,640 feet. Um, we can't set that on this aircraft. It's way higher than this aircraft can uh, be set. I think limits, um, I think limits a thousand foot um, AGL. Um, so we need to make a mental note of that. Um, also, we need to note the terrain around the airport. So, Telluride's 9,000, you can see got peaks both north and south and in front as well that are higher than that. Telluride RGNL weather, wind calm. Visibility 10, rain, sky condition 6,000 scattered, 8,000 scattered, 10,000 overcast, temperature 10, dew point 11, altimeter 3047. Okay, that's Telluride um, weather, that's, um, that's sounding okay. Um, 3047 is the altimeter, and actually as yes, we've been cleared already to our... Um, a level below flight levels of 13,000 feet, we could actually put 3047 in now. I normally would wait until we're a bit lower, uh, but let's put that in now before I forget. So that's very, very high pressure there. And you need to make sure this is accurate because you do not want to be crashing to any of those mountains in that, in that vicinity. Some reason VNAF's gone off there. Uh, the other reason for going to the hold um, at ETL is in case we are way, way too high. And we have seven miles between the ETL, VOR, and SETMA. 
and Setma is our final approach fix. That's where we would start descending uh, on the three degree glide path. Though I see it's actually 3.6 degrees for Telluride. Uh, we'll let the um, flight management computer work that out with the um, GPS approach, the RNAV approach. So I've had the throttles on idle, and you see we now actually come down to the required descent speed. In order to maintain that, we're going to need to keep feeding power in. We'll just have a quick look at the checklist. The next one really will be our descent checks, um, which is just wing and engine anti-ice, and we're monitoring that now. It's minus 22 degrees outside. Uh, we'll probably need to switch that on fairly soon, so let's put that on now. And we get an enunciation to tell us that. And then when we get below 18,000 altimeters, which we've set already, landing lights, passenger lights, and um, briefing not required, so seatbelt sign will be on. Fuel quantities and balance, well, quantity and balance is good. And approach aids tunes if we're using ILS, which we're not. Chilling in the flight management computer as well. So the whole um, missed approach is already in there. Um, so that's really good. It will actually fly automatically if we want it to. So you can see we're probably going to arrive fairly high at ETL. We've only got 15 miles. We're doing, what, 7 miles a minute. So it's only 2 minutes away. Sending around 2,000 feet a minute. Um, so we're going to be um, about 16,000. That's fine because we're meant to be above 13,000. So we've got about 21, we've got another minute or so um, to set my... So that's going to work out about right. And definitely would want the passenger signs on now. I'll switch the landing lights on as well at this stage. This is going to get quite bumpy. And as we're approaching ETL, I'm just going to bring the speed down a little bit. Try and um, bring some spoiling. See, it's really sluggish because of the altitude that we're we're at. I'm having to bring in quite a bit of spoiler to get it to reduce at all. And that would explain why. <laughs> didn't intend to do it. It's on flight level change, so it's holding my speed. And so the spoiler was actually not having it. <laughs> Let's try that again. So that's ETL. So now it's doing a um, kind of turn around to. Um, well, I'd like to think it's actually in the hole, but it doesn't indicate it is, so that's absolutely fine. What I'm going to do is just put heading hold mode on, as I said I was going to do. And we will go for about 280. We're, we're slightly outside of that region at the moment. 
and we'll come get the speed down as well. So it's going to level off at 13,000, so we're nearly there now. Thousand to go. I still have almost full spoiler out. Uh, let's do a right turn so we go within the hold area. And we'll just do a complete um, U turn. So it's still expecting us to fly to Setma. Um, what I might be able to do is to, is to take a new bearing to Setma from where we are. I'm not sure this is going to work though. Hmm. Yeah, that. Set my direct. Execute. Okay, that does seem to have worked. All right, spoilers can come up and maintain about 220. It gives us a nice manageable speed. And we've got the anti ice on still. We are. We're above zero, so that can come off now. So speed management is absolutely crucial for this. Okay, direct to set my 15 miles to go. Um, now I will need to just reset that because it hasn't quite picked up on the track it's drawn for Setma. why it wasn't I had it on nav mode um, heading mode rather I was wondering why it wasn't um, responding And what we'll do as well is set them as a final approach fix. We are some distance away. Uh, we'll just put the approach mode on and that will arm the glide slope. And this little magenta thing as that comes down will fly our correct glide profile. There it is. So 10,640 is our decision altitude, so it's gonna, we're going to hit that fairly soon as we start descending. And you see the importance of this here, I mean look, we're getting really, really close at 13,000, see why it's a, we're being told to fly above, at or above the altitude. So we've got some, quite a lot of terrain in the near vicinity.
So one thing about the descent into into um, Telluride is uh, is the speed because we're fairly high still. It, it takes a lot to bleed the speed off. So I'm actually going to start bleeding some speed off now, and then I think probably a good idea just to bring the gear down in anticipation. And there's the glide slope is engaged now. So I'm going to bring in 20 degrees of flap, so get the speed under control and even some spoiler. Uh, let's get the V speeds correct V speeds up. So V ref 117. So approach checks, APM bleeds will leave as is. Landing data ref we've got set. Approach setup and crew briefing complete and hydraulic pumps are on auto. So we're complete. And just see the runway just um, dead ahead there now. It's like a mini Innsbruck, this place. Maybe not quite as hair rising. Stick the final stage of flap in now. Throttles to idle. I'm just letting that speed bleed off slightly. We need 117 over the threshold. Again, a little bit like Albuquerque, set on a plateau. You can see just how near we are to the terrain around us. Okay, autopilot's coming off now. Minimums. One hundred. Fifty. Forty. Thirty. Twenty. Ten. Welcome to Telluride. So, 
Um, what I said earlier about the cabin altitude, we've got a um, cabin altitude warning on there, and that's because if you look down here, actually cabin altitude is increasing to above the sort of maximum level um, because that is the altitude we're at here. Right, let's just clean up the aircraft. We're just off the runway now. Oops, landing lights can come off. Taxi lights on the strobes can come off. APU I started and the um, uh, transponder is now set off. Going to bring up the shutdown checks. Um, I think I'm going to stick it in front of that building there, the one on the right. Just okay, there's no sort of steering off. Windshield heats can come off. Some instruments can come off. And engine run switches off. Taxi lights off. Strobe lights off. Seat belt sign off. And at this point we can turn the hydraulics off as well. Thanks for your company today. Do join me in the second part of the Piece to Piece series where we'll be departing Telluride and routing up to Aspen, Colorado. So I look forward to seeing you then. Take care.